It's really a pleasure to be here again with the Myeloma crowd, even in these weird times, as Jenny said. Um, I'm very uh, fortunate to have connected with the Myeloma crowd, uh, crowd quite some time ago. And I'm very happy to be part of this because this is really always for me a great experience because it teaches me what the real questions of my patients are. Obviously, my patients ask me in my clinic, but you know, there's oftentimes not really a lot of time for such questions. And I'm, um, I always like these interactions during those meetings, the Q&As, and I, I learn what's really interesting for people. And I think my patients benefit from that as well. And since you pitched uh, the idea with uh, talking about our exercise study coming from the imaging, and you will see what um, I will mention later, I was really intrigued in what can we do to help um, the bones to regrow and using the neuroimaging techniques um, taught us that bones of myeloma patients can regrow. It's not a guarantee. And we still don't know what we can really do. We know, of course, that bisphosphonates and our treatments are working well for that. But we think that even exercise workout for our patients in a safe environment is, is good. And so we do that at the moment at Roswell Park in a limited uh, capacity because of COVID, unfortunately. But we are working on, uh, together with the Myeloma Crowd and Health Tree, to get this out in the field. And um, if you can enroll in the Health Tree, that is very helpful. Then we will give you information about this. And we want to do an exercise study uh, with the Health Tree. Coming to myeloma imaging, and I, uh, it's difficult to stop talking about imaging for me because I have done that for over 20 years now. And it's, I think it very intriguing what we, what we can learn from imaging. Um, I know it's expensive, but I think it gives us so much more uh, information than a lot of other things that we do. So it's, it's a very important, very informative tool. The uh, topics that um, Jenny and Greg gave me were uh, here, as you can see, why imaging techniques are changing treatment. I try to answer that to a certain degree. Uh, what are the new guidelines for imaging and um, what in MRI, why is MRI still relevant? Uh, we can see myeloma and we can identify targets. So these are the topics I want to kind of give the introduction to, but then I think the most important part is the interaction, the Q&A later on, where I can answer, or Dr. Nangren and myself can answer questions that you might have about imaging. Um, what the first very important thing I want to mention is that imaging does not only show changes in the bones. You know that the bone marrow, and I guess all of you have a painful experience with the bone marrow biopsy, and I'm always bragging that I had four bone marrow biopsies on myself for research. Um, so I know how bone marrow biopsy feels, but that's actually where we, where we really know that the bone marrow is very important, that the bone marrow is inside the bone, because we have to put a needle in through the bone to get into the bone marrow. And that's also important for imaging because um, we can have techniques that show more the bone or better the bone and others show better the bone marrow. As you know, myeloma takes uh, place in the bone marrow, um, but the effects and the symptoms, one of the major symptoms are those osteolytic lesions, destruction of the bone, oftentimes leading to fractures. And I fear that most of you uh, have experience with that. So the bone is the, the area where the symptoms take place. So the disease is in the bone marrow while the symptoms are more in the bone. Um, oftentimes when I give and other colleagues give talks about uh, treatments, you know those timelines that we have really a huge uh, development of new treatments uh, within recent years, which is really amazing. But you can also see in the inner line here that a lot of new imaging techniques have been uh, developed. And I just see there's one double, have to change that, uh, the DC MRI. But um, a lot of techniques have been introduced uh, beyond just X-ray in multiple myeloma to use and to identify changes in the bone marrow and in the bone. So why are imaging techniques changing the treatment? I think a very important part is that we can detect the disease earlier, as Jenny already mentioned. Here on the left side is a minimal infiltration. Now this is actually looks like normal bone marrow of a healthy uh, adult. The lumbar spine is so-called T1 weighted imaging of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. And you can see the intervertebral discs, and I'm not sure, I hope I can use my, my pointer here. Uh, the intervertebral discs are darker or hyper intense compared to the bone marrow, because the older we get, the more fatty bone marrow we have. 
if fatty bone marrow is replaced by a malignant disease, like for example, multiple myeloma, you can see this diffuse infiltration. You see here, the vertebral bodies have almost the same grayscale as the intervertebral disc. So this is a diffuse infiltration and we see this in about 60% of myeloma patients. But sometimes myeloma patients also can have so-called focal lesions. And it's something that we talk a lot about nowadays. You can see those dark spots and those we actually did a study and I will talk about that later a little bit more. Um, we, we found that those are actually small tumors of myeloma cells growing in the bone marrow and we call them focal lesions and they have to become more and more important in recent years. So you see here on the background, uh, the focal lesion on the background on an almost normal looking bone marrow, but some patients also have uh, the background of the diffuse infiltration with a focal lesion on top of it, which is of course not very easy, easily seen because the background is darker. But these are the patterns that we see when we do MRI in multiple myeloma patients. So it's about 30% just diffuse, 30% just focal, and 30% mixed. That's why I said 60% have focal lesion, 60% have diffuse. So there's an overlap with this mixed pattern, and about 10% have this normal looking bone marrow. Why is it relevant? I mentioned that the disease actually takes place in the bone marrow, as you can see here. This is the MRI again, and again, you see a different patient. You see small spots of um, bone marrow infiltration. But if you see on the right side, the CT, the computed tomography, you see those bones look intact. There's no lytic lesion in the bones. You see here, this gray scale is very homogeneous. So you see changes, this is the same patient at the same time, one time with MRI, one time with CT, and you can see here the changes are visible in the MRI, but not yet in the CT, meaning there are already myeloma lesions, like small tumors, but no change in the bone, so no osteolytic lesion yet. This is very important to differentiate bone marrow from bone. Um, but of course, we don't want to wait until there are osteolytic lesions. And that's the reason why those focal lesions in the MRI, especially in patients with smoldering multiple myeloma, have become more and more important. And we looked into uh, a significant number of myeloma patients with smoldering myeloma back in the day with this uh, old definition of smoldering myeloma. And we found that if a patient has more than one of those focal lesions, their progression into symptomatic myeloma, meaning every step down is a, a patient progressing into symptomatic myeloma, they have a much higher risk to progress into symptomatic myeloma if they have those focal lesions in MRI. So we can kind of, to a certain degree, predict when the patient will progress based on those focal lesions. Interestingly enough, it's not only the focal lesions themselves. It's also very important if those focal lesions are growing or if they are staying the same. We did, uh, in a similar patient group, we did uh, um, uh, several MRIs over the course of the disease of a smoldering myeloma patient. And at that time, the patients were not treated just because of the focal lesion. So what is very important, if those focal lesions are there and they don't change over time, then there is no high risk of progression. Here, it's kind of the opposite than the, the other graph that you saw. You see every step up is a patient progressing. And here in these uh, patients who have changes sometimes, but no, um, no dynamic, no growth of these lesions or not more lesions over time, they don't have a high risk to progress. So one lesion or two lesions that are not growing are not very important or not very dangerous. But when those lesions are growing, when they so show kind of a cancerous characteristic, then they, those patients had a very high risk to progress, actually a 16-fold higher risk than these other patients. So focal lesions that are there and that are growing, at, or if new, uh, new focal lesions appear, that is an important uh, prognostic factor, and then we should definitely treat the patient. And we found that this was actually correlated with the protein level, but not, it was still an independent marker. And how did those patients progress? That's from the same analysis that we did. And it might be very, oh, sorry, very small for you to see, but those small red bees that are in here were all patients progressing with a bone disease. 
So those patients, we, we did the CRAB criteria and the B, the bone disease, was the major reason of those patients who were progressing with focal lesions, they develop bone disease later on. And that's why we think that the MRI focal lesions predict the uh, progression of, of bone lesions. Why is it important to predict it early? Um, several groups, and especially Dr. Langren's group, um, Niha Korde from his group, published uh, last year that patients that are treated with um, smoldering multiple myeloma get treatment. High risk patients who have high risk features, they benefit very much from their treatment. And a lot of those patients um, became MRD negative uh, by next generation sequencing and had a an really excellent uh, outcome. Uh, and what also was uh, important is um, the MRD, as you know, is, or as you might know, uh, is done from a bone marrow biopsy. And the bone marrow biopsy is just a small area in the bone. We usually do it on the pelvis or very rarely in the sternum. Um, and so we only get information from this single location. And as you might expect, if a focal lesion is there, we will detect something. If it's not there, then we might miss it. And we might have and have actually patients that are MRD negative in the bone marrow in the pelvis. But if you do a CT guided and imaging guided biopsy of an osteolytic lesion, there is still some active disease. So this is very important that we combine the imaging with the MRD assessment. That also led, all those, those experiences led to new guidelines of the International Myeloma Working Group. I mentioned that a higher sensitivity is important. And um, I really, really advocate for uh, using CT instead of X-ray and the colleagues who were involved in these guidelines um, also agree. Here is a patient who had pelvic pain and uh, outside they did an x-ray and they said, no, that looks fine. As you can see here, it looks like on the other side. So it looks like it's a healthy pelvis. But then we did a CT and it's unbelievable. But here, this darker gray blob here is unfortunately a plasma cell tumor. We did a biopsy and it was confirmed that it is multiple myeloma destroying the bone here and growing out of the bone. This is really a patient a few days apart, X-ray and CT. So you can see CT is much more sensitive. This led to the, uh, we did a comparative study and about 25% were negative in X-ray and positive in CT. So we have a much higher sensitivity to detect osteolytic lesions. And this in the new guidelines is the recommendation, for example, for MGAS patients. We do the CT instead of the X-ray uh, initially. We don't do it in low risk MGAS and in intermediate risk MGAS, but in high risk MGAS according, uh, according to certain markers um, will lead to a low dose CT or should lead to a low dose CT. If that is inconclusive, then the MRI is more sensitive, but you might know MRI is more expensive, takes longer. So the screening, and this is an international guideline, so we have to also, of course, take care of, of countries outside of the US who might not have access to all of those techniques. So we decided to first do the whole, uh, whole body low dose CT. If your uh, provider has access to an MRI or whole body MRI, then is, that's of course important. If this is positive, then we would do a PET because in the PET we see if those lesions are real, if they are active. So the PET CT would lead to a treatment indication if possible. Uh, if positive, sorry, if positive. Um, if everything is negative, then it's just an MGUS. In smoldering myeloma, very similar screening with whole body low dose CT, if inconclusive whole body MRI. If that's negative, we recommend a yearly MRI in smoldering because of those focal lesions that can appear over time and that then can develop into osteolytic lesions. If the MRI is positive um, and it's less than two, so meaning one focal lesion, then we would do it every six to every uh, every six months, and also do CTs to make sure that there are no no destructions of the bone. If there are more than two focal lesions, that would lead again according to the new guidelines to a multiple myeloma treatment. If the patient already has a symptomatic myeloma or a suspected symptomatic myeloma, we recommend low dose CT or if available PET CT. If that is negative, an MRI because of this high sensitivity. If that is also negative, we call it smoldering myeloma because if there are no other reasons, of course, there could be anemia, hypercalcemia, that would also qualify a patient to be symptomatic. But if, that, if the MRI is positive, again, two, more, two or more focal lesions would lead to treatment, a positive FDG or CT 
um, would also lead to uh, a treatment because bone destruction is a reason to treat. Why is MRI still relevant? Um, because we want to also identify targets of the treatment. And here's something that really I always think when colleagues tell me, oh, I'd rather do x-ray because I, um, it's cheaper, it's faster. But why would we do something that is inferior? So like the mole optometrist um, who says this is enough. If we can see this, I think we have to be more sensitive and more aware. And um, as, uh, um, as I mentioned, we have these focal lesions. What happens to them after treatment? We saw that if a patient gets treatment, a lot of those focal lesions disappear. And we did that in MRI, so MRI is still good. And we see that we have a lot of, uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, a lot of focal lesions left. The downside of the MRI is that it doesn't differentiate between active disease and, and disease that has basically healed but is still there. You can see if you, if you look closely here on the, right, uh, on the left side, here that's the right because we look from the front. Uh, on the right you see this gray scale here and after treatment you see how it shrank. The problem is um, here in this T2 weighted imaging, it's white and white or hyper intense means that it is cystic. So it's a fluid uh, accumulation, not active myeloma anymore. So MRI can help with treatment monitoring, but PET CT is actually the, the treatment, uh, the diagnostic of choice. A newer technique, and you might hear of that uh, from other colleagues, and we have also started using this, it's a so-called diffusion-weighted MRI, which helps us to identify those lesions, you can see here, which, which with much more contrast. Here, this is the patient after treatment, and you can see it's much less of those lesions and much less um, and much smaller lesions. So we see we have a very sensitive technique to um, follow those focal lesions over time. And we also want to learn more, and that's kind of the targeting uh, effect. This is a myeloma patient where we did a biopsy of such an osteolytic lesion. And uh, it sounds a little bit barbaric, I, I uh, agree. And we started that in Germany, and you know we are very rough uh, people there. No, but um, this is under local uh, anesthesia and conscious sedation, not, not intubated, but something to, to be sleepy. And it works very well. And I really, we have done over 90 patients now and no patient really complained about it. Our radiologists are so good in what they're doing. They do that for solid tumors all the time. So the patients really say this sedation helps them. They don't really recognize or get anything uh, from it and we had no complications whatsoever. So now we are doing further work up and you can see here, this is even a very small osteolytic lesion and I checked, we got plasma cells out of it. You can see here the needle goes in and it exact, exactly hits the focal lesion that has been here. And at the moment we are doing research on those uh, cells that we get out of there. And we found first uh, differences actually from a regular bone marrow biopsy, which would be actually in this area, because as you can see here, there's not much between the outside and the, the bones. That's why we do those uh, bone marrow biopsies here. But compared to those osteolytic lesions, we see some changes in those cells. So they are not always the same cells. And with this, I would like to end. Um, it was just kind of a very short overview uh, about those topics. And I'm more than happy to discuss further later on in our Q&A. I thank my amazing team at Roswell and the uh, people from the University of Heidelberg, German Cancer Research Center in Heidelberg, and Dr. Langren, who really taught me a lot about myeloma. And I'm really looking forward to hearing him talk now. Thank you very much. Thank you.